Okay, uh, I guess Jim had pressing engagements this week, so in place of Jim, we're going to have Marilyn stand in. Everybody help me welcome Marilyn. Hi, everybody. My name is Marilyn. I'm an alcoholic. Marilyn. Jim um, did have something important. I work with Jim, and... Um, he can't be in two places at one time. He had a very important business meeting this evening, so he asked if I would come here, and it's always an honor uh, to speak at an AA meeting. I think he picked me because I was, like, standing there when, <laughs> when they made the dinner plans. And also, he knows that I really um, I follow him. He's my sponsor, and um, I... Uh, go to his meetings every week at the uh, 101 Club, at the Stairways Group. I've been studying the big book um, fervently since I've been back in the program, so I think that's why he picked me, so I'm going to try to um, teach you the things that I learned from Jim about these couple of pages here. I'm, I can, I'm a, that's one of the things I learned is you don't go too far when you're in a big book study at Jim's. <laughs> you might make it through a paragraph or two. Uh, and that's probably, no, we'll try to make it through a couple of pages. He didn't know, when he asked me to speak today, he did not know where he left off, so I had no time to prepare. So I was sitting here tonight um, asking people where we left off and try to write down a couple of little notes uh, so I could sound um, halfway uh, sensible here. So um, hopefully I'm starting in the right place. Let's turn to page uh, 111. All right, the first um, principle of success is that you should never be angry. This is talking to the wives um, about the alcoholic husband and how to deal with him. That's why it's called a chapter two wives. Now, um, obviously, this um, chapter is not only beneficial to wives, but to us as alcoholics to see how to get along with other people. And... Uh, and to make us realize how we can help our friends who are struggling out there. So it's not just about the way that a wife should be, but how we should be to the alcoholic too. The thing I really like about the way that Jim teaches is he'll read a sentence and then show you how that sentence relates in about five other places throughout the book. So he reference, cross-references and shows how everything fits together in this book. And that was really um, important to me because um, I had had a long time in the program and then I had a, a pretty lengthy slip. When I came back, um, I really started studying this book like I'd never had before. It was uh, really important to, um, to read the book this time because I never really found it that necessary before. I was kind of sober on on fellowship for a long time <laughs> and this time coming back I was uh, kind of suffering so um, he told me to read the book and that all my answers would be in this book and sure enough they're all in here we have to learn the book because um, one of the most important things that he ever told me was when somebody shares in a meeting I used to think that when people shared in meetings that it's your opinion like anything goes whatever works for you and coming back, it was kind of confusing. So he said that anything anybody says in a meeting, you can temper it and put it to the test of where is that in the big book and where is God in that equation? And uh, if it's not in the big book, you're not going to argue with the person, but you surely don't have to take it in and uh, accept it for yourself. And that was very important to me. So in order to do that, you have to know what's in the big book and what things that you need to t uh, throw out and what things you need to take in. So I've been uh, studying this, you know, to stay sober. And I believe that my job today, I have a job, big job, <laughs> and that is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics. That, um, that is my mission from God, my purpose for living Funny enough, it's the only way I'm going to stay sober. So it works. It's a good thing. It's my mission. So anyway, that's why I'm here. Now, uh, the first principle of success is you should never be angry. 
And I'd like you to turn to page 66, keep your, about the middle of the second, of the first full paragraph. But with the alcoholic whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it's fatal for when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. So anger and resentment is a block to your relationship with God. And the thing about this book and um, our steps is that there's these sp spiritual principles are the same for everybody, whether you're alcoholic or not. Now, the difference about ha harboring resentments for we alcoholics is if we harbor resentments, we'll drink. And for us, the insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. So that's why we're not allowed to have um, uh, anger. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men. But for the alcoholic, these things are poison. Poison because if we drink, we die. Now, for other people, they... They, it too um, blocks them from the relationship with God, even for people who not, are not alcoholics. The first principle of success, because success principles are true for the alcoholic and for the non-alcoholic. And if we want to have a relationship with God, we have to be free from anger, whether we're an alcoholic or not. Your husband becomes unbearable and you have to leave him temporarily. You should, if you can, go without rancor, without rancor, without anger. Patience and good temper are most necessary. And that's so you can, you know, get your power from God. Now, our next thought is you should never tell him what he must do about his drinking. Th these uh, several pages that I'm going to try to go over here are all based on the fact that the guy's got to decide this for himself, the the decisions got to come from within. If he, he gets the idea that you are a nag or a killjoy, your chances of accomplishing anything useful may be zero. When people tell us what to do, we rationalize and justify and do the opposite just because we don't like to get told what to do. I, at work, I'm a sales manager. And <laughs> I learn this every day. I try to tell people what to do. And they retaliate, you know, alcoholic, non-alcoholic. You got to, people got to think that it's their idea, you know. <laughs> All right, girls, like uh, the husband or the boyfriend, you got to let him think it's his idea. It's the same thing with the alcoholic. We're all like sensitive people. We, we don't like to be told what to do. We put up walls. So you need to, um, you need to take a different tact. He will use that as an excuse to drink more. You know, if, if we're told we're wrong, we just dig in our heels and try to make that wrong and right, and we're even wronger. So um, he tell you he is misunderstood. This may meet to lonely evenings for you. He, makes, he may seek someone else to console him. Not always another man. Well, that's true. But uh, be determined that your husband's drinking is not going to spoil your relations with your children or your friends. They need your companionship and your help. It is possible to have a full and useful life, though your husband continues to drink. We know women who are unafraid, even happy, under those conditions. Do not set your heart on reforming your husband once again. Okay, so talk about a full and useful life, though your husband continues to drink. There is no help to be in self-pity. And self-pity is a very ugly thing. Um, Jim says it's the ugliest of all the character defects because it blocks not only your relationship with God, but it blocks your relationships with other people. And I, I find that to be true. Who likes to be around people who are constantly miserable and talking about negative all the time and whining all the time? It's just not... Um, you just don't want to be around these people. I mean, everybody's got problems, but people who all they do is talk about their problems, really, you do want to stay away from them. There's not much faith when you're in self-pity, you know, talking about your problems. There's not much hope there.
On page 62, it talks about self-pity. Okay, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our, trouble, of our troubles, driven by a uh, hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that sometime in the past we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles we think are basically of our own making. So the uh, wife of the alcoholic can be happy if she's not in self-pity. We cause our own troubles. It's, it's, once again, it's a spiritual principle. Alcoholic or non-alcoholic, people cause their own troubles. Now, do not set your heart on reforming your husband. People absolutely have to decide for themselves. Turn to page 90, second sentence. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. You may spoil a later opportunity. This advice is given for his family also. Amen. We're in that chapter, aren't we? If you just leave people alone, maybe they'll come to you for advice someday. If you nag them, they'll never come to you. They don't want to hear it. You said it a million times before. They weren't open to it. Jim tells me that I am not allowed to tell other people they're wrong. <laughs> which was very disturbing to me because I said, Jim, I said, I know how to like really help people, but I need to tell them that they're wrong because they have to know what's right. And he said, no, you're not allowed to tell anybody you're wrong, they're wrong unless they ask you. It made me very sad, but uh, people ask you. But it, it's just that it doesn't work. I mean, if you tell people they're wrong, they're not going to listen to you. It just makes them mad at you. And it frustrates you because it's like, how come you don't listen to me? I know what's best for you. Well, they're not listening to you. You're frustrated. They're frustrated. They're mad. It's not worth it. Wait until you run across people who are interested. And leave the other people alone. Just be happy. This is a program of um, attraction, not promotion. So be happy. Maybe people will want what you got. And... Um, so don't set your heart on reforming your husband or any other alcoholic, you know? Now, we know these suggestions are sometimes difficult to follow, but you can save many a heartbreak if you can succeed in observing them. I've worried about other people's sobriety, and it's gotten me nowhere. I know that there was nothing when I had a slip. There was nothing anybody could have said to me to make me quit. It had to be, it was a spiritual touch. It was a touch from God. And it's got to it's got to be like that way with people too. You you can't logically talk people into quitting drinking. It's got to come from within. Your husband may come to appreciate your reasonableness <laughs> and patience. This may lie, lay the groundwork for a friendly talk about his alcoholic problem. You're being a friend. And maybe he'll open his mind to what you have to say in the future. Try to have him bring up the subject himself. He's got to decide for himself. Turn to page uh, 92. Right in the middle of the page again. Let him draw his own conclusions. He's got to decide for himself. Do not make him wrong. Wait until you have permission to speak. Attempt in uh, instead to put yourself in his place. I think that <clears throat> we all remember what it's like when we were drinking. And we all know that there was nothing anybody could have said to us. So the best way you can help anybody is to just be happy. Don't be critical. Let him see that you want to be helpful rather than critical. When, now, when a discussion does arise, you may suggest he read this book. And this actually is our solution to our problems, is everything we need to know about alcoholism is found in this book. Turn to page XIII, in other words, in the forward to the first edition. 
X, X, I, I, I. X, it, it's t 13, isn't it? In uh, dog years or something? Or uh, Roman numerals, that's it. The forward to the first edition. There's a lot of meat in this page. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. The answer is in this book. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no other fur further authentication will be necessary. In other words, this says everything. We think that this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. This is the book, the account of our experience. This book is not written in theory. This book is written by experience. This is not a theory, some doctor's idea of how you might be able to recover. This is written by alcoholics who said, we did this and this happened, if then, and if you do the same thing, the same thing will happen to you too. This is a book written by experience, not by theory. There's power just in reading this book. Turn to page 18 too. Gonna, we're going to do some book flipping. Why read this book? Uh, second full paragraph. or li It's a little paragraph. We hope this volume will inform in comfort those who are or may be effective. There are many. The purpose of this book is to inform so people can relate, to read the whole book, even the stories in the back, so that you too can relate to these people and say, that's me. Wow, that's me too. I did that. Also to comfort, meaning to give you hope. Like I was that hopeless. I did those things. That was me. But look at what they did. They did this and they got that. There's the hope. So the purpose of this book is to inform and comfort so that you can relate to it and you find the hope in it. And that's why all the answers are in here. Because you kind of self-diagnose yourself with this alcoholism thing. It's the only way it works. You've got to believe it. It's deep down inside. You've got to decide for yourself. XI or XXIX. This, the first sentence is, what is the solution? And what is the solution in the next paragraph? It gives a solution smack dab in the middle of the uh, paragraph. It says, he accepted the plan outlined in this book. So once again, we've got to read this book to figure out how to recover from this. And that's the solution to all our problems. Page 58, how it works. We read this in every meeting. It tells you the purpose of, of this. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. Can you relate to me? Let me tell you what I did, and if you do what I did, you'll get what I got. If you have decided you want what we have, if you like what happened to me, then you're willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps, and the steps are outlined in this book. So it's all about reading this book, figuring out how it works, figuring out how to do these steps, uh, doing the steps, and then helping others to do the steps. It's pretty simple. You can't uh, give it away if you don't have it. So you got to do the steps to teach others how to do the steps, right? All right, now, let's get back to page 112. Read this book. The first three words to this uh, page. Now, it says, or at least the chapter on alcoholism. <laughs> I'd like to know what chapter is about alcoholism. I think all these chapters are on alcoholism myself. So, in other, in other words, read the whole book. Now, tell him you have been worried, though perhaps needlessly. You think he ought to know the subject better, as everyone should have a clear understanding of the risk he takes if he drinks too much. Now, obviously... We do not get sober on self-knowledge. Um, if, if that was true, um, if just knowing about the problem kept us away from addictions, then, um, 
there wouldn't be any doctors in this program because they know about addictions, yet some of them succumb to it. And self-knowledge doesn't keep us sober. There's many, many pages um, in this book that talk about, about how self-knowledge does not keep us sober. It's not fear. It's not it's not keeping it green either. People talk about, well, if you keep it green, you're going to stay sober. It's not about keeping it green. It's about cutting the grass. It's about doing the steps, doing the work. Do what they did, you'll get what they got. Not don't remember, remember your last drunk. Then half of us wouldn't be here because half of us were in a blackout on our last drunk. So it can't have anything to do with that. It has to do with removing the blockages that we have between us and God, and that's cutting the grass. You think he ought to know, where am I? Uh, show him you have confidence in his power to stop him from moderate. Nobody really has a power to stop or moderate, but he has, you know, I have confidence in people that they find God who has all power. So hopefully that's what he meant by that. Say you do, know, do not want to be a wet blanket, though you only want him to take care of his health. Thus you may succeed in interesting him in alcoholism. He probably has several alcoholics among his own acquaintances. You might suggest that you both take an interest in them. Drinkers like to help other drinkers. God put that in our blood, in our deepest psyche, that we want to help other alcoholics so that we could do the 12 step and continue in a happy and useful life for the rest of our lives because it's one of the steps, it's one of the principles. It's an if then. You help other people and you stay sober. My very first um, talk to anybody or experience uh, with anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous was I was, um, this was like in, in 1982, I was in a bar and I was practicing control drinking I, as long as I had two drinks, I was, I was good to go. Just two, though. I figured it out. So somebody bought me a third drink, and um, I said, no, I can't drink this. And they're like, well, have it. And it's sitting in front of me, and I'm like, no, I can't drink it. So I stood up. I go, anybody want this drink? And uh, everybody just kind of looked at me, and I'm like, it's Chavez. Doesn't anybody want this drink? It's Chavez. <laughs> so everybody just keeps looking at me, and I'm like, oh, you people are crazy. So uh, this guy came up to me, and he goes, why don't you drink that drink? And I go, oh, you want it? He goes, no, I don't drink. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't drink? He goes, no, I'm in AA. I go, oh, wow, you're in AA? You know, I've been thinking I wanted to go to AA because I know that AA is a place where people control drink. This is what I thought. And um, I have really figured out the answer here. It's two drinks a night. So I was hoping to go to an AA meeting sometime so I could like speak there and tell the people how if they only have two drinks, they're going to be okay. So I could like help these people. I said, do you think I could go to an AA meeting? And, and the guy said, oh, yeah, I think you could go to an AA meeting. <laughs> But it was just really weird. Uh, that was like in the back of my mind to help alcoholics. And I was really sadly uh, awakened when I got to the meeting. <laughs> and none of you drank. I thought I was in the wrong place. But, um, but anyhow, I found that I'm just a typical garden variety alcoholic. But we do like to help other drinkers. We really do. Your husband may be willing to talk to one of them. If this kind of approach does not catch your husband's interest, it may be best to drop the subject, but after a friendly talk, your husband will usually revive the topic himself. If you let it go, he'll bring it up again. Um, if we've read this book, we have seen that there's an answer. Now, this may take patient waiting, but it'll be worth it. And meanwhile, you may try to help the wife of another serious drinker. So this is where the Al-Anon uh, program started. Um, people helping other people who had uh, loved ones that were drinkers. And um, they taught each other uh, how to how to be have a happy life, even though you're living with somebody that's alcoholic. 
And uh, I had had uh, 14 years in the program, and I had a, uh, I was married for those 14 years. I met my husband in the program, and I had a slip, and I was drinking for four and a half years. It's a hard thing to live with an alcoholic, and um, it's just you're really afraid. So you go to the meetings to learn how to you know, to keep an open mind. You know, I'm sure that if he was harping on me for that four and a half years, I, you know, I sure wouldn't have hung around, but he just kind of let me burn myself out. And, um, and, I, and I really appreciate that for him, from him. I really thank him for helping me by just leaving me alone, you know, because if you're an alcoholic and you're drinking, you don't do well. You know, so he knew that I would figure it out sooner or later that perhaps I wasn't doing well, you know. <laughs> Four and a half years later, I thought that possibly I had a little problem. But anyway, I'm glad to be back. I've been back for about a year and a half now, and I'm, um, I'm really happy that God gave me a second chance. Um, anyway, now... Uh, Suppose now, suppose, however, that your husband fits the description of number two. The same principles would, which apply to number one should be practiced. In other words, leave him alone, be happy, show him the book. That's it. You know, just, you can't control other people, you know, because it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, I try this every day. Being a sales manager, <laughs> this is really hard for me to realize, you know, I have to tell myself this constantly. You just can't control other people. Um, leave them alone, be happy, um, give them little suggestions here and there, but you surely can't control them. If you try to control somebody too harshly, they retaliate. They do the opposite, just just because they're, just to retaliate, just to, because uh, they're mad at you. All right, now, this, uh, but after the next binge, ask him if he would really like to stop drinking for good. Do not ask that he do it for you or anyone else, but what he like to will have to come from within. Um, turn to page 144. If the book is read, the moment the patient is able, while acutely depressed, realization of his condition may come to him. If he reads the book, uh, we hope the doctor, when the man is pre presented with this volume, it is best that no one tell him he must abide by its suggestions. The man must decide for himself. So in other words, it's telling the wives to leave the guy alone, let him decide. It's telling the employers to, let, to leave him alone, let the guy decide for himself. It's telling the doctor to leave him alone, let him decide for himself. But it's telling all these people to give him the book. Give him the book so he can relate and then see the hope. So he can relate and decide whether or not he's an alcoholic himself. And then he can see the hope of the book. So that's a pretty reoccurring uh, theme of this book. Now, the chances are he would. Show him your copy of this book and tell him what you have found about alcoholism. Show him that as alcoholics... The writers of this book understand. We, as alcoholics, can help the alcoholic where no one else can. We don't want to be told what to do. However, there's something about somebody who was in bad a shape as us telling us what they did that we actually listened to them. And that's what the 12th step is all about. Reading this book is a form of getting 12 steps, 12 stepped, because all these people are telling this story to you. You know, a few people in this part are telling their story to you. Bill is a wonderful 12-stepper with his story. He goes through all the steps and everything. You know, we can relate to all these people, but we have to relate to it ourselves. Nobody can tell us we're an alcoholic. We ha it ha the conclusion has to come, and, to, and the conclusion that we're an alcoholic is a gift from God. But if we're open-minded when we're reading this book, that gift will come. But it has to come from within, because that's where God is, within. <clears throat> God has to tell you. I'll tell you, I got 12-stepped... I got 
I got 12 step by by a movie. I got 12 step by uh, the movie uh, Days of Wine and Roses. I don't know if any of you know Ray Allen. He's uh, he was like he was like 90. He had 45 years of sobriety. He was 90 when he died. And he was a really nice guy. I'll tell you, he really practiced this leave him alone, love him principle because this guy would ask my husband about me all the time and uh, he'd say I really miss Marilyn tell her I love her and stuff so you know one, once in a while when I was out there drinking you know we make a lot of enemies <laughs> in our alcoholism so I would be looking for a friend so I'd be thinking oh maybe I'll go see Ray's he says he loves me and I'd go visit Ray and he, sure enough he'd be like I love you Marilyn just you know just know that I love you, I'm always here for you, that type of thing. And he never tried to preach to me or anything like that. So when he died, I wanted to go to his funeral, and I wanted to go to his funeral without alcohol on my breath. So I was quitting dr drinking for one day, and that was just to get the alcohol off my breath and to go to the funeral so I could drink again. And my husband went to a meeting that morning, it was a Sunday, and here I was like not drinking <laughs> one day in four and a half years. And uh, turn on the TV, and Days of Wine and Roses was on TV, and I said, oh, I think I'll watch that. I'm not drinking today. That'll be fun. Big mistake. Because that movie spoke to me. Uh, it was a spiritual experience. That, um, there was Lee Ramick and, um, and Jack Lemmon, right? And Jack Lemmon um, took Lee Ramick out on a date, and she had never drank before. She didn't like the taste of it. So he said, oh, try a Brandy Alexander. You like that? So she did. So she had several. And she was happy. And she's like, oh, I love this alcohol. So they go down to the river. And there's all kinds of garbage on the river. And she goes, oh, I love this alcohol. Alcohol makes the garbage look pretty. And uh, so then their life, then they got married and their life was bad and they had all kinds of fights and insane asylums and lost jobs and it was horrible and um, he finally came in the program and at the end of the movie he was in the program and she was not and they were living separately and he said to her why don't I wish you could have what I have I am so happy in the program my life, I'm, I'm so happy. Why can't you have what I have? And she goes, because I need the alcohol to make the garbage look pretty. And I stood up and I go, but you're making the garbage. And the words bounced off the TV and hit me in the face. And, to, and now I'm thinking that I didn't even say those words that God like sent them through my body or something I, if that sounds freaky or whatever because it was not my idea to quit drinking and I was I remember sitting there thinking like oh yeah I was in AA yeah 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 it's a bunch of brainwashed people you you know you're not really having fun and so the fact that I said that to her I don't even believe it was me I believe it was God speaking to me but anyway the word slapped me in the face and I came back because God opened my eyes and I saw that I was making the garbage, but nobody could have told me that. It had to come from within. And in my per personal experience, it came really from within because my own word slapped me in the face. Show him as alcoholics, the writers of this book understand. Tell him some of the interesting stories you have read about people losing their lives, losing their jobs breaking up families, very interesting stuff, right? Um, we don't do well when we drink. So it's good to read this book to see just how, how sad your life can get. You know, a lot of people come in the program uh, and their lives haven't gone totally down the tubes and that's really nice. But maybe they can read this and see that if they continue to drink, it will. Because it's if then, just like if you do the work, you'll get the results and you'll get, if you do the steps, then you'll have a happy life. Well, if you continue to drink, you're going to have a miserable life. It's, it's if then too. If you drink, it's invariably fatal. Uh, if you think he will be shy in a spiritual remedy, ask him to look at the chapter on alcoholism. I know the one says more about alcoholism, but wouldn't you think that a spiritual remedy, that would be probably the we agnostics, right? 
So I'm confused. I can't ask Bill what he meant because he's dead. I'll ask Jim. Okay, anyway, then perhaps you will be interested enough to continue. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. If he is enthusiastic, your cooperation will mean a great deal. In other words, it, I don't know what that means. Now, if he is lukewarm or thinks he is an alcoholic, we suggest once again that you leave him alone. Leave the guy alone, you know? Once again. Okay, so this is, I'm, I'm going to stop, I think. So let, <laughs> let him come to his own conclusions. The power's got to come from within. Be happy in the meantime. Show a good example. It's attraction, not promotion. And read this book. Learn this book. The answers are in this book, all the book. To relate, you got to read all the stories, even the back of the book. Now, if you personally have not done these things, you need to read the book. Because you're, the only thing that's going to help you to stay sober is found in this book. And teaching others what is in this book is going to keep you sober. <laughs>